is my nice on my now. My name's Roger Shepard. Uh, I live here in South Korea now. I'm here. This is my fourth year of my own business. And tonight I'm going to talk to you about the subject that I study, which is the Pact to Dagger. Um, something I stumbled upon in 2006 whilst I was here on a holiday and then came back and revisited it again in 2007. And then in, wrote a book about it with my friend uh, Andrew and David Mason, who a lot of you may know who he is, who helped me edit the book. And then in 2009, I came back to Korea again and hiked mountains for six months. And I kind of got lost in the mountains and lost in the spirit of the mountains and the, and the beautiful tree scenery. And then I um, left a great job in New Zealand. I was a diplomatic protection officer for the New Zealand police. I was a diplomatic protection officer for the New Zealand police. We don't talk very loud normally. And, um, <laughs> and um, had a prospectful career ahead of me, but found that even a little dull, um, taking care of important people. And I've always lived an adventurous lifestyle. I was a wildlife ranger in Africa for eight years. I was a member of the New Zealand Defence Force, Reconnaissance Army, and then the police. And then I decided to take up this new challenge here um, it paid to dig up because it seemed that no one else from outside of Korea was doing anything about it. <coughs> and it seems to be a place that's unbound in what one can learn from it. So tonight, <coughs> I'm going to talk about the paid to dig up as one mountain system. What the paid to dig up on the Korean Peninsula is currently recognised as is that green line. Now, a lot of you may know already stuff about the Pact to Dagger. The literal English translation is White Head Great Bridge, meaning that a great bridge emanates from a great mountain called Pact to Sun Mountain, which is located at the very top of the Korean Peninsula. <coughs> Highest mountain in all of Korea, 2,750 metres high. has a spectacular crater lake inside it, and is a very holy and sacred place for the Korean people. And I'll discuss with you later how long that may have been the case. It's kind of prehistory stuff. Those mountains that are marked on it, particularly the ones in the northern part of the peninsula, are ones that I've already visited, and there are photos of it in that book. It's about 1,700 kilometres long. The bridge is continuous. It's never divided or broken by water. Therefore, it is the watershed of the Korean Peninsula. And it's been described as many different things by the Korean people. But we don't know for how long they've been describing this as. I mean, for the last 120 years, Korea's lived in a pretty tumultuous time due to Japanese occupation, then the struggle against the Japanese, and then their liberation from World War II, and then there was struggle for one nation between 45 and 48, and then the subsequent division and then North Korea going into a kind of a Stalin's way of thinking, and then South Korea going, going into a Western capitalist style line of thinking. And so a lot of the previous connection the Korean people had with mountains was lost during the last 120 years possibly. However, it's still well practiced here in South Korea, and it's currently kind of getting through a, a, a revitalization period where people, now that South Korean people have more time, <coughs> more money, they have more interest in discovering who they are and what their actual history is and what it's like to be a Korean. So since the 1970s and the 1980s, uh, the Peter Dagan became a rich that the Korean people hiked recreationally here in South Korea. And a lot of them did it because they thought it made them more Korean, others did it because it made for the share of history of it, and others did it to capture this thing called the natural geomantic energy that the Petri Day Garden supposedly emits through the landscape. So kind of a geomantic feng shui. In Korean it's called Pung Su Jiri. But the Korean version of Pung Su Jiri is slightly different from the Chinese version of feng shui. Feng shui in China is a bit more isolated and can be a bit better targeted. The original theories of Pung Su Jiri um, are a bit more spread out and a kind of, if you look at the geographic landscape of the Korean Peninsula, and I'll explain more about that soon. So, I talked before about 
the relationship the Korean people had with their mountains prior to perhaps the Japanese coming here and all the rumours and stories that came out about the Japanese uh, trying to change the Korean people, change their language, change who they were and their identity and make them a, a proper colony of the Japanese Empire. For a long time, the 75% of the Korean Peninsula is mountainous. So for the last, since the Ice Age, the Korean people have lived here with their own language. And of course, they lived further up, past into Manchuria, into the Mongolian parts of the Asian continent. And here on the Korean Peninsula, I've discovered this since I've been here in Korea, when I talk to Koreans, they have this unique relationship with their mountainscape. And a lot of that's to do with that Pung Su Jiri theory that they can be part of the mountain and live harmoniously with mountains and rivers and waters in this kind of peninsular kingdom. So it's possible that the Japanese made an attempt to change that part of their culture as a way to snuff out perhaps this form of nationalism they had with their mountains. So here we see the Korean Peninsula um, shaped as a rabbit. And I understand that about 1904 the Japanese launched a, about a two or three year expedition on the peninsula to study it geographically and topographically, to chart it in a western manner of mapping and charting the peninsula. Because the Japanese used a lot of western techniques in regards to building uh, a, a government and infrastructure. And during that period they possibly found out that the Korean people had a very strong relationship with their mountains. It was unlike most other <coughs> cultures that they had encountered. So I don't know where the story of the rabbit came, but we're all familiar with the Korean Peninsula being shaped as a rabbit. Okay, so they, <coughs> one of the ideas was that they can defeat this relationship they have with mountains by perhaps animating it towards the peninsula towards being the shape of a rabbit. The tiger thing didn't come out, from my understanding, until after the rabbit theory. I think it was about 1903, uh, a young boy decided to sketch um, the Korean Peninsula in the shape of a tiger after the rabbit. So there was a bit of competition there towards the identity of the Korean people through mountains. So what the Japanese also did was break the Korean Peninsula up into different mountain systems or different ridges. <coughs> because <coughs> it's possible that what was happening before they decided to do this was that the Korean people didn't actually recognize ridges or subsidiary ridges or perhaps not even the Pact of Dagan. Or the Dosan Guksa, who was a Shila monk, sorry, uh, in the ninth century, supposedly recognized the Pact of Dagan as one ridge system, as one ridge <coughs> that spread this natural energy called Pung Su Jiri throughout the peninsula. So he may have been the first person to say this main ridge system is called the Pact du Dagar. But we don't know what it's actually really called. And back then people couldn't fly an aircraft or look through satellites to map the peninsula that well. It was all done on foot. And Kim Jong Ho with the Pei Dong Yoji Dog <coughs> was probably the most accurate map made after all the previous attempts of trying to make a good map of Korea. So what they did was they made the Pact of Dagon one line system, that's the main thick black line there, and then all these other subsidiary ridges, which we recognize in Western topography, as rivers that basically control the flow of water, or, or ridges that control the flow of water. So we have a Jong map, and Jing map, and a Gi map system. So <coughs> With that, there's a kind of a separation of the Korean Peninsula being one giant entity, which I haven't mentioned yet because I want to sort of surprise you with something next. So in South Korea, it's called the Pag Du Dagan. So some people here in this country believe that by calling it the Pag Du Dagan is incorrect. Because what we're doing is we're identifying only one line from Petrusan to Jirisan. Other Theorists will believe that the Pagdu Dagan 
continues past Jenny Sun, which it actually does as a continuous ridge, an unbroken ridge, into Namhe and then under the sea and comes out at Halasa as one continuous ridge. And that's quite a romantic theory because Pakistan is the highest mountain in Korea, it's a volcano, and Halasan is the highest in the southern part of the peninsula, and it's also a volcano. So Pakistan is often seen as the grandfather mountain of the Korean people, and Halasan is the grandmother. And all the other mountains in between are part of a genealogy, a family of mountains. So the Korean people live in this landscape where all the mountains are interrelated to each other, all interconnected to each other, and the people live a connected lifestyle with these mountains, supposedly. <coughs> so, when I started traveling to North Korea, <coughs> excuse me, um, I was pretty naive about you know, North Korea and, and you know, what they might think of their mountain systems there and compared to South Korea and of course all the horror stories that go with North Korea the first time you go there but when you get there and you spend more time there you start to feel a bit more relaxed about the place and recognising as human beings with their own unique way of thinking, their own political styles and their own sort of academic thinking but they are Korean. And so in North Korea they don't call it the Pei Chudega this line, they call it something else. Does anyone know what it might be called? Any ideas? Any from the Korean audience? <coughs> it's called the Pei Tu De San Jogi. So literally that means basically a mountain system that is connected to one mountain, Pei Tu San So the all mountains in Korea for one entity that spreads all the way back to one mountain, back to back to some mountain, the whole is one sacred mountain in North Korea. So Pak Tu Day San Jogi is that. That's what they see the Pak Tu Day on us. They don't see it as one line. They see it as a the whole peninsula has been one huge mountain system. They recognise the Pacto Dagon, the actual geographic ridge. They know what that is. But they won't call it Pacto Dagon, they'll call it Pacto Day San Jogi. So Pacto, like the Sun Jogi thinking is like, and I could be very wrong about this, because I'm not a, I don't go to universities and study this stuff, and I, I don't speak the Korean language very well at all, and I'm not a Korean. So I'm not going to claim to be an expert on Korea. But a lot of Koreans here in the South believe that's the correct terminology for the topography of the Korean Peninsula, San Jogi. So the Pei Tu Dei San Jogi is what it's called there. Can you speak louder? Louder? Again? <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> so Korean people live closely with their mountains. I'm not saying they do that anymore in North Korea. It's a different case, but like, you know, they tend to stick to a more purer version of the Korean language in the North than what's happening here in the south where it's, the south is more globalised and we're seeing a lot of you know, Congress and other uh, influences on their language happen here. So, some evidence of the Korean people having a very strong relationship with their mountains pre-Buddhism uh, can be seen with some of these topics like the mountain spirit. David Mason's probably spoken to you before about Sunshin. Uh, you know, this type of mountain worship was practised all over the world uh, after the Ice Age 10,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago, Korea has a very unique uh, uh, mountain spirit relationship uh, and that's still practiced here today. Probably one of the few countries left in the world that does this. So, but that's got to do with the fact that they live with a lot of mountains. They've always been attached to, to their mountains. They've always had a strong relationship with their mountains. <coughs> Sondo, Sondo is not Zen. Sondo is a form of like Korean mountain Taoism that the Korean people practice a lot there and some still do now. In some cases it's called Buksongdo, which is a kind of a form of traditional Korean yoga. Um, but Songdo was a kind of a um, Korean way of man being close to mountain, like a mountain hermit. And you see this in China still practice much today. Tangun, the kingdom of Tangun. Uh, we all know about Tangun being the founder of Korea here in the south. He's kind of practices a mythology. Uh, in the north he's more so believed to be Dangun was the name of a dynasty, a kingdom of people that formed a civilization on the Korean Peninsula around the Daedonggang area 
and it was called the Tang Boon people. Okay, so here, yeah, but of course the story of Tang Boon is all related to mountains in mythology that he was you know, the, the, the grandson of the heaven, earth, of the, of a godly, a god from heaven, and so the Korean people began. But a lot of ancient civilizations were forming their new civilizations based on uh, you know, visitation from other parts of the world. <coughs> um, I mean, uh, this that only is a thousand years because those some books are were supposed to be the um, betrayal of Pung Suji here in Korea. Hoyong Jige. Hoyong Jige is a Korean term used to basically explain one going to the mountains and obtaining a vast spirit, a vast connection with the mountainscape. It's very hard to translate. Perhaps Anton Jacob can try and translate it one day. Um, but it's, a, it's like, it's still used a lot here now. So a man or a person goes to the mountains and escapes to the mountains and becomes part of the mountains. So it's been part of the language, you know, since they've been speaking Korean. This, this term here. Nationalism, post-war Korea. Um, that's more so to do with the Pekju Dagan, okay? So they've become the Pekju Dagan here in South Korea. And then currently, which I'm going to break from the next subject, uh, the Pekju Dagan, the Pekju Dagan Jogi as a biosphere for the Korean people, rather than a, many other things. So, recently I got kind of didn't get involved, but I was invited to get involved with um, uh, the Korea Forest Service, who are um, researching on behalf of the Korean government to list, tentatively list the Pei Tu Dagan as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Uh, and Seoul National University uh, um, have a research team doing this. So they knew that I've been to North Korea, so they wanted me to you know, show them images or tell them stuff about what the condition of the Pekki Day Sun Jogi is in Bukhan. And um, so I was, I was pleased to, to you know, go and talk to them about that. But when I found out more about this, and I'm not an expert on this subject, um, so every time I'm going to talk about it, I mean, there are people being paid professionally to study this, have been doing it for the last five years. Um, there'll be another five years before they, before they decide that the Pekki Day Gun is even worthy fills the criteria to become nominated on the tentative list as a World Heritage Site. It's a huge project, huge topic. Okay? And I said to them, you can't be serious that you're going to try and make the Pape today going to UNESCO World Heritage Site in South Korea? That would be like cutting the Great, Great Barrier Reef in half. You're saying, we'll just make the bottom half of the World Heritage Site. Screw the rest of it. With the Great Barrier Reef is a living organism. It has to be complete. So I reminded them, well, what does the Bay Today Gun mean to you? Is it just a, geogra a geographic bridge, a section of Korea that you currently occupy? I mean, the Bay Today Gun means a lot more than that. And they knew all this. They knew that you know, what I was talking about was making sense. But they were just a little bit nervous about how to go about trying to get the North Koreans on board to join them in join with them in a nomination to make it a world uh, heritage site. Because, you know, back to Dagon, to academics it might not be, to scientists it might not be, but to the Korean people, the back to Dagon is seen as a kind of living organism anyway. I go back to the previous map of the Pei to De San Jungi. All these mountains are interconnected to each other. The humans and men, uh, men and mountains live together in one place. It's a kind of a natural energy. So I spoke to them about that. Now, for it to become a tent on the tent of list as a UNESCO World Heritage Site, there are six cultural criteria and four natural criteria. The South Korean government is only targeting the natural criteria. It's quite a difficult thing, the Bay of Dagon, because I mean, the Bay of Dagon is not very well known internationally already anyway. It's not really recognized for anything. So, I'm just going to explain to you some of the stuff they're currently researching quickly, because this gets a little bit boring if I get into the photos, um, and, and, and just quickly go through what they're doing. And, and, and I support what they're trying to do, and, but it is a new field to me. So, the IUCN, which is the um, uh, 
International Cons Conservation Group um, did a commission on national parks in Asia in 1982, and they found a, 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 a few places in Asia which would not be uh, qualified for a World Heritage Site, but none were in Korea. This is in 1982. This is a long time ago. Most Koreans here in this country didn't know what the Bacta Dagon was in 1982, I think, anyway, because it had been drummed out of it. Through Japanese occupation, through war, through liberation, and through this new survival mechanism they needed to have to survive. This uh, introduction of Christianity, of Westernization, capitalization. Koreans here wanted to survive and make a living, and they did that very well. So, if I, and it wasn't educated in schools. So, most people that knew what the Bay of Dagon in South Korea was began hiking it early in 1982. And back then, it was an untouched wilderness. So it was, like I said, it wasn't identified as being um, uh, on a tentative list in either North Korea or South Korea during that period. Okay, this is part of the natural, cri the natural criteria again, contains superlative natural phenomena or areas of exceptional natural beauty and aesthetic importance. So a tough one to match as well. Okay, so I can't, I don't have time to explain what kind of research they're doing to define these pieces of criteria, you can just leave it up to your own imagination. But only eight sites in the world have been inscribed alone based on that one section of criteria. But you can use a lot of pieces of criteria. If there's ten, you can use all ten to try and get nominated on the tentative list. But you need to be very, they need to be very thorough, they know this. The outstanding examples representing the major stages of Earth's history. Once again, quite tough. So it's quite a bold decision by the South Korean government to uh, try and get Bank to Dago listed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. But it could be done, and I'll get into that shortly. So these are, that's what they mean by the previous criteria, this type of stuff. Number systems. Bank to Dago doesn't qualify as a number system, it's not significant enough. It's not like the Himalayas or the Andes. Southern Alps, the Rocky Mountains. That's not to say it couldn't be. Right? There's more research. So most of the stuff hasn't been researched well enough. So what's happening is the South Koreans are starting to research it very thoroughly now and try and get answers to match all this criteria that's required for it to become on the tentative list. Okay? So that's why they're very interested now in North Korea. There's so much there is undiscovered. And that North Korea may hold the, 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 the pieces of criteria that would help it become a uh, World Heritage Site. And they may just be starting to figure this out, that you know, it can't actually be done without North Korea, because there's a lot there that could answer these requirements. Outstanding examples representing ecological and biological processes. Okay, so the um, Pactusan area uh, has already been recognised as being a place of <coughs> immense plant diversity. And I would have to say that's the truth um, from my experiences there. Okay, this is getting quite interesting now. Like, you know, there's not a lot of uh, uh, wildlife on the Korean Peninsula, full stop, anyone, especially here in South Korea. There's a lot of deer, a lot of pig, and some other species of animal. But there's nothing that's threatened or rare or that's vital to for global interest. But <coughs> there is Chinese deer, I don't know the scientific name for that. There's the bottle, which still exists here in South Korea, it's been rediscovered in the last 10 years, I think. Bits and pieces of small population of goddles, kind of a mountain goat, mountain antelope, in Sodoxan. Uh, there's Godal, Wadoxan Mountain, um, Dogusan Mountain, and Odesan, uh, uh, who knows where else it could be. Deer, Obviously, reintroduced into Jenny Sound, but in North Korea, bear exist. I mean, I've seen bear feces and bear tracks, and I've spoken to people in North Korea, and bear population is very wild and untouched and natural. There's nothing introduced about the bear species in North Korea that still exists there. Um, perhaps not large populations, but then, once again, we don't know because no one's researching this. Not even the North Koreans are researching this. So th these are great. You know, areas that the Korean people can get involved in somehow if we can sort of start to cool down the relationship and start to focus on something that the Korean people share together, which is kind of what my whole topic's about, Mr. Peter Dagon. 
interesting enough, leopards, I did some research on this, the last, did you know that leopards existed in Korea? Yes. Yeah, they do. I mean, if you look at some of the old paintings in the temples, particularly in the Sun Shin Guts, or the old, or the Dung Wun paintings, they're often wearing a leopard pelt. Huh? I've seen leopard pelts in Korea in my travels. I do a lot of travel over the peninsula. I go to these like remote places, and I've seen leopard pelts hanging on walls in like, um, Small collections, private collections, the bus, the owner, where did it come from? This has come from here, like 50 years ago or so. And leopards, when I worked as a wildlife ranger in Africa, I mean, leopard is the most elusive animal that can survive anywhere. When I lived in Johannesburg, leopard would live in the mountains behind the cities, you know, one kilometre from a population of a million people. They can live anywhere and they will eat anything to survive. Uh, they will eat vegetables, they will eat plants, they will eat fish, they will eat meat. They eat grass, and they're solitary animals with about a 50 kilometer square rate, uh, territory. The only time the male and female meet is to mate, and then they go back and live separate lives. So the last leopard that was found in Korea, in South Korea, was a Jetty in 1963. I couldn't find a photo. Uh, man, it would be awesome to find a photo. Tiger. I mean, tiger is like a national animal of Korea, yet there's no more existing here, as far as we know. So my research found out that the last tiger caught in South Korea was in Gyeongju in 1922. But there may have been other instances after that, I'm not sure. So, it gets back to what tiger population, if any, might still exist in North Korea. Now, the North Koreans I've spoken to believe that there's no more tiger population in the Peitusan area. The Peitu go on, the Peitu, uh, the Peitu go on, which is a plateau, massive plateau. I'll show you some photos of this shortly. And, um, <coughs> but they did tell me that there were stories of tiger living in the central part of North Korea on the Peitu Dagon Ridge, <coughs> where it's more rocky. And that's in the Pyongan. Nando region, uh, sort of if you went to west from Wonsan into the central part of North Korea, that's where they believe some tiger may still exist. I mean, but once again, there's no research done on this. I mean, there's no, because of the, 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 you know, how closed North Korea is, but I hope to break all these barriers and, and keep gaining the trust from them for me to go there and start researching this type of information for Korea, you know, on behalf of the South Korean people as well. So, it'll involve going and talking to people who hunt in, 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 the, in the gold ones and the plateaus and whether they've seen any sign of tiger. A lot of people might not want to talk about it, you know, because they're probably poaching them. I mean, if the military out there, they'll be poaching them. All the militaries do that. So, anyway. So, the other section is cultural criteria, okay? So, this is the part that the uh, that Seoul National University hasn't touched on yet, the cultural part. So when I did a talk for them, I talked just about the cultural stuff, the stuff that I'm talking to you now about, the, 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 the unique uh, relationship that the Korean people have with their mountains, blah, blah, blah. So the following are notes from um, uh, uh, um, a workshop that was done in 2010, I think. So these aren't my quotes, and I hadn't listed the names of the people, uh, but they're all good quotes. And so what happened was, you know, people started turning away from, okay, natural criteria, they start looking at the cultural criteria, but in their answers I start to see a different pattern. I start to see an interconnectivity of mountain scale. The Beitu Dagan is actually more than just a line. So here, Mount Sorak. Mount Sorak, Sorak San Mountain was um, researched to become a, a, a um, UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1996 through biosphere. Basically biosphere is like man's relationship with this mountain. And but they didn't submit it because it still they weren't confident that it would pass the criteria to even get on the tentative list. But it's still there. So in this sense they're talking about connecting ranges again. So BDMS means Big to Dagan Mountain System. So Mount Solak is part of a serial not blah blah parts of the tape that range Mount Bungan. So I was talking earlier before um, Perhaps during the Sunshine Policy years, there would talk about joining Gungamsan and Sodaksan together as one national park. And um, that would mean somehow dismantling the fence in a certain section. 
so that animals and plants could migrate in this little sort of pocket of unique biosphere that's surrounded by military, a bit like the DMZ, I guess. Okay, Korea's green growth strategy, that's kind of another interesting thing too, because the Korea Forest Service had quite a unique green growth um, policy going on in Korea. I won't get into great detail about that, but it involves uh, harmonising people closer with nature again. Here in South Korea, there's like 50 million people living on a place the size of South Island or New Zealand. It's a lot of people, but only 30 to 20, 30% of the land is lived on, the rest is unoccupied due to mountains. So South Korea has a unique uh, opportunity to manage their relationship with nature. 50 million people harmonizing with nature. So they have a quite a unique opportunity to do well at that. Okay, so the International uh, Conservation Group uh, launched a Global Connectivity Conservation Network. So what they're talking about there is almost like um, these uh, cross-national parks. So vast expanses of wilderness that are shared by more than one country. In Africa we saw some stuff back in the 90s where um, migration routes became protected. Not as UNESCO World Heritage Sites, but they became protected so that elephants could be buffalo and huge species of antelope could migrate through countries and routes that they've been using for a hundred thousand years or so. So it's starting to like get bigger with the picture. In a sense, the whole planet should be a World Heritage Site because the picture starts to get bigger and bigger. We start to make all these sites and then we start to recognise them as being all interconnected with each other. And we all know fundamentally that everything is kind of interconnected. So, Okay, so we get back to the tiger thing. So once again, they start to connect Russia, China, and the Korean Peninsula. These are zany ideas, but in theory, they're actually quite correct. Because that's what it was once like. So in the end, is it really that important? <laughs> After all this? I mean, how are the UNESCO? Who the hell are they to tell someone what's important? I mean, you could look at it that way. Huh? You want to spend like hundreds of millions of dollars doing a research on something that might not happen just to please some huge gravy train based in Switzerland uh, called UNESCO. Is it really that important to Korea? I mean, Korea's a small country, right? I mean, you know, no one cares much about Korea. It's all China and Japan. Korea's kind of living in turmoil. More than South, there's more important things to do. So, yes, let's go ahead and try it. Maybe North Korea and South Korea could work together to actually, if not make a World Heritage Site, at least learn more about the Take to Dig and perhaps work together to protect it for themselves as their own sacred piece of mountain system. It doesn't need to be a World Heritage Site. It could just be something that's special to the Korean people. Okay, yeah, so that's it. Sorry, yeah, thank you. So that's enough of that. Now I'm going to show you some photos, of, of, uh, some uh, photos of the Cape Today out in North Korea, and um, I hope you like them, and they might give you an understanding of, um, you know, kind of how beautiful the Cape Today Island system is. It's not, you know, it's, what is the most beautiful system in the world? We don't know. It's right to the first of the year. Before that, these are some other projects I'm working on this year. Um, Four Seasons uh, documentary. Um, so the North Koreans recently gave me permission to um, make a nature wildlife documentary of the four seasons of Pechusan Mountain on the North Korean side, which is about 45,000 square kilometers of land, I think it is, it's quite big. And um, I'll be using North Korean, if I get the money, I'll be using the North Korean camera crew from the Korea Central News Agency, and I've already done a lot of work for them on my last visit last year with the New Zealand motorbike expedition. They rode their motorbikes from Russia into North Korea, across the Gasong, and continued through the Halasan. So, and then NBC Korea, who I do a lot of work with, um, want to make the actual documentary. So my role would be to go to North Korea, 
with the camera crew. If we get enough money, I'm going to recruit a New Zealand cameraman, you know, like a guy who's done work for the BBC or National Geographic, who can basically show us how to do this, because I'm going to do this. Uh, and I doubt the more Korean guys will have enough experience to know how to capture high quality stuff. But whatever, as a team, we can learn together how to do this, and then take all the footage back south, and over the next two years, make a beautiful documentary for the Korean people. Uh, we're trying to get half a million dollars for that, that's the minimum. So the Korea Communications Agency, the KCA, um, they're currently holding a proposal for that, and we'll get an answer in March. So hopefully they'll trust me with that one. Chulbosan, which is another mountain in North Korea. Um, failing Paechusan, because Paechusan will be logistically very difficult, because in the winter seasons, the winter seasons are really, really heavy there. Um, minus 50 de degrees centigrade you know, on a windy day at the summit. Um, you can't walk up there, you can't sleep up there, you'll die. So we'll, we'll be using military helicopters to get to the summit in winter and hopefully down to Tonji as well you know, to drop off with the topper and then spend a the whole day filming. But weather changes all the time, so we may be stuck there. Um, yeah, or maybe repel or abseil down to Tonji because it'll be all by stuff. So there'll be an actual road throughout into Tonji, the lake there. Um, and then snowmobiles and all sorts of crazy stuff. So I'm actually a little bit worried about that section of it. Um, and then, perhaps, if I did, Tubor sounds a lot more easier because we can access it by vehicle, even in winter. Okay, that's located on the east coast, uh, in Hamgyeongbukdo, near Chongjin. It's a very beautiful part of Korea. The mountain scape there is like the Grand Canyon, a little bit. It's really trippy and weird. And that's on the tentative list. It's being nominated as a UNESCO World Heritage Site by the North Koreans but just nominated at this stage. And while I'm there, I might draw a story on the, on the legend of Myeongte, which is a dish, a fish. So apparently the, 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 the Myeongte, the word Myeongte comes from the Chubulsan mountain area because it's in a, it's in a county called Myeongchon. And one day, who knows when, Myeongte, a member of the Tay family went fishing, found this weird fish, didn't know what to call it, came back and said it's called Myeongte, after the province we live in. And, 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 and the name of the family. So I'd like to do a, a lovely story about that, interview the family, because the Tad family still lives here, apparently. Uh, and then write a book. And then 2016, I've been hounding the North Koreans for the last year about this. I want to walk the whole entire range from Pakistan to Halasan, because all I've done in North Korea is visit about 25 mountains of the Baek Dagon, Baek Dagon in North Korea. About 20 of those are remote and untouched but I want to do a continuous through hike through there. So they want me to do this. Okay, the North Korean things work very slowly. You know, they, they don't, North Koreans have always been very accurate with me about what they can do and what they can't do. And they never said I can't do it. They say, we just need to take these steps first. So they don't flower with the enthusiasm. Uh, they actually sit down and tell you, this is what we can do, this is what we can't do. So I find it very easy to work with. Okay, time. Right, and then we'll just go for some photos, and then um, I'll tell you some stories behind the photos, and then some questions if you have any. What time are we finishing up? So this is uh, Patrisan and Chonji Lake. This photo was taken in August uh, last year. Who's been to Patrisan Mountain? A few of us. On the Chinese side, yeah. What was it like to see it on the Chinese side? I mean, I was lucky to see it for the first time from the Korean side. And, um, I've never been to the China side yet. And um, I, I was just blowing away by it. It's a very powerful place. And you can see why it's uh, sacred to the Korean people. There's another uh, photo. Of, uh, these photos are in my book, too. Hello, Can you hear me? Yeah, so. Yeah, that's another photo from my book. I'm not a trained photographer, I'm not saying these, but these photos are any good. I do know my subject. Oh, so, you know, these are North Koreans on the Tangun Bong, the highest peak in Korea. And, uh, what time of year? Uh, this is also August. And, uh, see the kid wearing the England football shirt, number 10. And the guy that 
behind these uh, the camera operator I work with when I'm in North Korea. Or what we, and this was during the Pakistan Alasan motorbike expedition. So they rode their motorbikes up to Pakistan summit. So there's a road that goes up there. And then normally there's a car park, a small car park. It's very uncommercialized. Okay. Every, most, you know, it's, it's not like mountains here in South Korea. And then people walk up um, a, a kind of trail to the mountain. But there's a small road here that goes up there too. So they took the motorways up there, which is probably the first time. I saw, I saw that motorbike ride on the uh, internet uh, oh, yeah. video. Yeah, yeah. yeah they, these guys are taking the video for it. And I, I was taking stuff with a little handheld as well. Uh, okay, that's um, yeah, more photos of uh, back to some mountain. That's looking across at China. So up on the highest point there, just behind that peak, is where you guys normally go to. It's like the top of the chairlift. So on a perfectly good day and back to some mountain, you can actually shout out to each other from north and south. And a good friend of mine who does tours there, Korean guy, he came up with a recent idea. This is a crazy idea. But he wants to go to Pactus in winter when the lake's frozen and then go down to Chongji Lake, right? Because there's no real demarcation line right? on the lake itself. So when it's frozen, where's the line? There's no official line. So he's saying that he wants to go down there and camp. Like, okay, I don't know how they're going to do it, but like, say, that's North Korea there. I'm still in China, I'm going to camp my tent right here. Because yeah. there'll be no one up there in winter, there'll be no guards up there. It's just, it's, it's, it's not on the North Koreans, like there's, there's no facility there for that. The guys are dying if they get them up there to survive. But there'll be helicopter patrols over there. Yeah. Okay, this is the uh, lake level view um, of Pacific Sun. How deep is the lake? I think it's about 400 meters deep. In winter time, the lake ices over four meters of ice and then four meters of snow on top. It's a lot of wet. So the ice never really melts. This is like, uh, this, this is in June. Um, so it's, it's almost melted off by now, but the snow never really disappears. That's why it was called white head pet. I mean, the climate's a little different now, but traditionally, Pactusan Mountain was always covered in snow. What is that to the very far right here? It's a little shelter. And yeah. I presume they store food in there. Because there's a weather station down there. Okay? So, it's probably some kind of supply where they might cool store food, uh, possibly ammunition. Uh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. so they need a cache of ammunition if they need to go down to the lake to take hold uh, and control an incident. Then they might have um. I was told to get off that thing when I was uh, in there in 2011. It's in the NBC uh, documentary, which has been on national TV three times so far this year, uh, last year. Um, they made a, a, a show about my visit. It was quite funny. But they were worried that I, I was going to force the cave in. This is views of the south from the sun over the peak to go on. That's the plateau. It's kind of a volcanic plateau. So it consists of volcanic soils. And, uh, it's really fascinating. You, you don't think you're in Korea when you go to a place like that. Because we're used to Korea being small and jagged, tight, constricted. It's landscape, it's landscape. It's very beautiful for that reason. But suddenly when you get to the plateau, you start to make sense of where it all comes from. So this is the big watershed of the Korean Peninsula. Uh, this is another photo. So let's take this on mountain in the background. So this is me standing there. On the peak to go on plateau, and um, this is in June 2012. That's great. Yeah. So the three peaks you can see there. Uh, the far peak, the peak on the far left. Sorry, the, the peak in the middle is Jungungong, and the peak on the right of the photo is um, Kyungnabong. And then the Chinese border is kind of maybe up to the left there. So the Koreans only own one third of the Sun Mountain, two thirds Chinese territory. Mm. Um, and I think, yeah, I don't know the details. It was to do with the, um, the Chinese, uh, the Korean War involvement with the Chinese. So I'm putting that to the 
There's another photo of the pentagon. The rhododendron growing wildly. So, you know, we talk about the UNESCO World Heritage of plant species. They believe that plant species might be the, the thing that catches the imagination of UNESCO. Uh, all these undiscovered plant flower species that are waiting to be recovered, particularly places like North Korea. So if the South Koreans, you know, want to involve North Korea somehow, um, then there's a lot of research that can be done at DPRK. Um, just some gills. This is in the Great Forest. So as you get lower and lower from the sun, um, down to about 2,000 meters, 1,800 meters above sea level, you start to break into these huge untouched forests, massive, large pine forests. Um, a lot of them are forestry areas now that are forested quite well, but it's all natural forest landscape and it's very vast. God knows what's inside there. Because, you know, people don't recreationally go into the wilderness in North Korea. They might go a little bit in there to get some food, to do some herb and spice collection, maybe go set a trap for an animal, uh, cut some wood if they're allowed to. But yeah, there's no sense of adventurism in North Korea, like say there is here. So God knows what's out there, uh, waiting to be rediscovered. Okay, this is the mountain called Tehubong, and it's the uh, Hong Kong, the So that's the picture they're going to rest here in the middle, the one that kind of goes down to the saddle. So this is, uh, as you can see, it's very well forested. This is natural forestation. I mean, it's probably secondary growth, I don't know, but. It's all very untouched natural uh, forest. And you know, don't get me wrong, North Korea is denuded, but you know, it's obviously denuded where it is, around you know, populations around Gasong, Pyongyang. But here, where there's no one living, it's, 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 uh, it's very pure. So, the South Koreans at Seoul National University recognize this. They were already aware of the satellite imagery. That the condition of the bank today going in North Korea is actually a better condition than what it's here in South Korea. And South Korea has pretty good condition, right? But there's a lot of interference here in South Korea because there's mines, there's telecommunications, uh, there's um, you know, lots of infrastructure going on. Which is vital as well, okay? But it's not in the pure state that it is in North Korea. And that's not because North Koreans want it to be pure, it's because there's no infrastructure. There's no one there. It's not a twist, it's just the way it is. But the Pantagol and Pantasan regions are very sacred to the North Korean people because <coughs> what they recognize the Pantasan Julia being for them is a kind of a revolutionary area, sacred for revolutions. So during the anti Japanese campaigns, the, um, the freedom fighters, and there were many other, you know, there were many famous freedom fighters that were based in the Manchuria region were infiltrated in and out of these great forests and mountain regions of the Pacific San Juli. And they were hiding out in the mountains of the Pacific San Juli. And there's a lot of rats of the old camps that these guys uh, hid in as well during the, the struggle against the Japanese. So they see the mountains in, the, in their part of Korea being sacred for those reasons as well. So this is a shot that I had to take. We stopped the vehicle. Um, I left my turn in the back seat. We're in the middle of nowhere by now, and um, I didn't see this ever anywhere in Korea. Apparently, it used to be very popular on the Han River back in the days. And um, I was taking a leak by all chances, and there was this big cow uh, trying to sexually assault me at the same time. Uh, and so I'm busy like, trying to keep this cow away and taking a leak, and then I see these guys come flying down the river at 25 kilometers an hour doing this stuff. Uh, so I just ran back to the car, got my camera. And then just sat there. And, um, so that this is like uh, you know, ancient logging they're using. This is the mountain of Tulusan Mountain. Uh, I'm standing on the bank of the Sun Jogi here. This is the Yangang Go again. This is in the northern provinces of North Korea. Uh, a place called Pegangun. Uh, Tulusan Mountain is about 2,309 meters above sea level. So we had a great day that day. Um, Often the, the problem with me was the guys that I work with are from Pyongyang, the city boys, right? So they don't really get into this mountain 
rubbish, unlikely, you know, but were good friends, right? So they worked really hard in the, in the traditional Korean way of hospitality, you know, that you see here. They worked really hard for me there to get what the good friends do, okay? So we have to recruit local people who know how to get up the mountain, yeah? And that's not always easy too, because you know, a lot of people don't go to the mountains. It took us about a day or two days to find a route to that mountain. Okay, this is after we climbed the mountain. This is like a day or two later looking back at the mountain. And um, that mountain there is like quite a healthy bear population. Possibly, I mean, I'm not expecting bear, but we saw a bear sign. We saw fresh bear feces, you know, like that morning, um, and bear tracks. And um, a team of four of us walked up that mountain. And um, that's near the top there, and um, I just my camera bag, I saw my guy, lovely guy, old man, um, Pak Kun Cho, what's his name, and uh, he didn't need any water or food, he just tallied up the mountain, and I saw my two boys, from, uh, two uh, ladies from Pyongyang, they were getting more and more tired, they were carrying the food and water, alright? So we split up, some wild feet at the top, we keep walking, get up to the top, I'm only carrying one bottle of water, I was thinking, well, when the guys catch up, we'll get some more water. It was like six or seven hours to get to the top, yeah? And no sign of the other two, right? So we're sitting with no water. And he's okay. The local guy, he's okay. Like, he's the toughest males. And we're eating, like, wild honey. So he's carrying a pot of wild honey. Right? And um, I'm really dehydrated now, by the way, because, like, you know, shit, we're top of a 2300 high meter mountain. This was behind us. Mountain I climbed in Korea. So the baby's kind of drove up the baby's side. We were on the boats, right? So we wanted to just drive up there. But this is the highest mountain, the first highest mountain I climbed in, uh, in the Korean region. And um, eventually the guys turn up, yeah, to the water. You know? So they're looking very sad face. Uh, <laughs> I'm wondering if they drunk all the water. Right? So it's supposed to be about 10 bottles of water in the bag, you know? And, um, so they up and they didn't say whether they had water or not. Yeah? So, then when I open the bag, there's like four empty bottles in there. Fair enough. And then there's six full ones in there. Yeah? And I'm looking at the other and what's wrong? Yeah? So I grab one, uh, rip open the top, and I just tap it, and it's so good. There's some smile and I thought, no, I'm all just carrying soju and water. <laughs> so there's six bottles full of soju. <laughs> and they were one small of water, right? And the soju is the Tahtori soju, a corn. Right? So it's local stuff. It's really good. Yeah? But you don't want to drink it when you're dehydrated. Right? <laughs> and I'm standing there, I'm thinking, God, oh, yeah, am I going to get angry with these guys? You know? You know, I want to get angry, you know. I can't, I can't get angry with them. So I just want to throw it away, you know, make a scene. Fair enough. So I was thinking, okay, we're going to get down to this mountain. We've got no water. Okay, then we're not going to die. Right? This is going to be really uncomfortable. I'm trying to take good photos. You know, I'm dehydrated. I'm mentally fatigued. I need something, you know, to get the zen back into me. And then these kids turn up on the mountain, you know. Yeah, you don't see people in the mountains more free hardly ever, right? So these, there's, there's two kids there, and there's two at the top of the picture. You can just make out the top of this one. So, these two are brother and sister, and they're just walking from one village to the next. Very beautiful, healthy looking young teenagers. You know, maybe 12 or 13 years of age. Excellent skin, very, you know, <coughs> good conditioned uh, human beings, because you know, they're living on natural food. Everything's organic in North Korea, right? You know, most of the time. So, not by choice, just because they don't have fertilizers to help them grow crops. They weather the most of the time the crops through the sanctions. They don't get the fertilizers they need to grow more food. And so, my guy says, Do you guys know where some water is? And he goes, They go, Yeah, we do. So, they get us to this tiny little spring, which we've never found. And it's just a trickle of water. They had to put like a blade of grass in there to actually get the water to ride down the blade of grass and then slowly fill up the water bottle. It's ice cold, yeah? And we were lucky to find that water because, um, you know, it basically did say that lies, but it made up the set a lot better. So this is more Korean, North Korean landscape. I chose all the mountains I wanted to go in North Korea, by the way. They didn't direct me where I had. Just go and put and go. 
I just plucked them off a map. There was no information about them. And then they went away and found out that I could get permission to go to these. And I did. So this is that's the Gamma Go On. The friends know what the Gamma Go On. The Gamma Go On is the great plateau of Gamma uh, in Yangang Do. And it goes through to um, Chatang Do. And um, if you look, this is standing on the mountain. And uh, if you look at that water, it's quite big and untouched. And there must be untold species of plant, animals, perhaps a leopard, maybe a tiger. Uh, the locals believe that wolves still existed. They, they fit their herd wolves. They never actually, perhaps locals have seen them, but the uh, wolves can live there. I, I find it quite difficult because wolves need to eat a lot of meat. And, um, maybe about 50 kilos a, a week or something like that, one animal maybe. And so they will be encroaching on their livestock because the North Koreans, um, their livestock mainly consists of cattle and uh, goats and sheep. So these reasons have sheep. If anyone believes in Bigfoot, you know, hmm. that's probably a good place for Bigfoot too. Yeah. Because in central China there's legends of you know, great hominid style Yeti Bigfoots that yeah. still possibly exist. Uh, this is a river made of stone, Volgang. Yeah. Um, it's about two kilometers long, it's It's a remarkable find as well. So, the Pantu Day Gardens, you know, this comes off the Pantu Day Gardens. You can hear there's water rushing underneath that, because you can't actually see the water. You can hear it. So, when you're in the forest walking to this natural feature, you can hear a giant river. When you walk out of the forest, all you see is this. So there's no actual, there's water that you can't get to it. Um, okay, this is in uh, October 2011, so it's a little drier now. And um, this is in Pumanambo, so this is looking uh, west of the mountain of Pakistan. Um, to the left, you can kind of see a, a clearing area. So in the uh, summer season, they would bring the cattle up there to graze their sheep. And horses as well, apparently, on So it's a very kind of, you know, I don't know, North Korea is a very, okay, this is just a random photo. Um, there's no sense of pali pali in people's arcade. Right? There's no urgency. It's kind of like the, our grandparents' generation before. You know, everything was done in the slow time, everything was worked out, it'll all work out, don't worry about it, what's the rush, you know. And so, you know, there's no telecommunications for the local people, so there's not that kind of stress anxiety levels that we experience in our current day. It's not saying that they're better off than we are, we're just noticing these like subtle differences in how they live. You know, to sit on the back of a car, you know, you're not in a rush, eh? Okay, this is uh, 2000 in again. This is a uh, Blue Star Mountain, 1.23 meters. This is uh, at a um, this is the source of the Intingan River, which is a very famous river here in Korea. Um, that, that was another trip. That was a great experience. Our so, uh, guide said we're going to take one out. It took five hours. Yeah. So I gave him the nickname of Mr. Hunchigan after that. Eh? He was a great guy. I had a good time with the people. Eh? Ways. And the Koreans, like, I had a good time here, so why shouldn't I have a good time there? Wooden people, so this is near the people they done, but this is like, we start to get into the autumnal season. This is the sad pool go on, so I found three plateaus whilst investigating the Petro Dagon in North Korea. Uh, the Petro go on, the other one was a, was a one called the Tolong go on. These are unknown. Probably a satellite they are, but people. Because no one's researching this stuff, we don't know what's going on there. And this is the South Pole one and Gang Wanda. It's like a giant elbow with V. So during the Korean War, this area was heavily infiltrated by paratroopers because it's a flat terrain, it's a high altitude. And this used to be part of the old pass to Wanda from, from Seoul uh, that people walked or drove. And there's a train route there too. So it may even be in the old train route. Because there is a train line, the rail line is still there in North Korea. Um, but a lot of the rail lines are the narrower gauge that are used for coal. 
Uh, Gong San, uh, Tom Tom, this is the August last year. Gong San again. Uh, this is just some locals. Neil uh, Frank San. Big pleasant. You can sort of see the whole damn jiggy there. This is just downtown Pyongyang. Okay, moving to the south. This is Sodak Sun in the north. You can see Kung Lung Star announces in the background. There's a good photograph of Sun Zuki uh, interconnected mountains. Because they are actually all connected back to, back to Sun Mountain. Now, you can get to any region of this peninsula and you can walk to back to Sun Mountain without crossing the water if you need to do it. And back to Sun Mountain is the uh, water source for the Kung Lung the Amnok Kung River. So, in theory, the only piece of land that connects the Korean peninsula to Asian continent is this mountain, the Sun Mountain. So, you know, if you start to romanticize about that, then you can see there's been a kind of a node for great natural energies. Just that one piece of land connects it to um, the rest of Asia. Kari Pong Sun, that photo was taken in 2007, right? Kari Pong Sun, Tongi Dan, Mountain Spirituality, some people. Most people have been to this mountain. Uh, this altar is maybe 1500 years old, but the site's probably 5,000, 7,000 years old. Who knows? And, you know, for as long as men have been worshipping the heavens or animistic gods, Tate Sun Mountain has always been a sacred place for this. People in Korea, I forget the name of the little Anja underneath it, Mangyong Sa, maybe. Um, people in Korea when they believe in this stuff go there when they're sick. When they're having a crisis in their lives, and they go to this place and they um, meditate, or pray, or just be there for days and weeks and months, as long as it takes, and they wait to be visited by a mountain spirit. And there's lots of stories of people claiming that being visited by some kind of mountain spirit, and it revitalized them, it cured cancers, uh, it changed their life around. So they're trying to reconnect with something that is. Clearly sacred for thousands of years. Uh, that's just a traditional Sunshine Day so they have on the same mountain uh, once a year on National Foundation Day. That's probably for me, I'll tell you about Getting dressed up. This is another photo. This is the big day gun from Tom Wong, Tom Tom Book Ball. You can get all these like dancing songs in the mountains in South Korea where people live and sell goods and wares to the hikers and um because I've done a lot of walking in this country then you know I spend a lot of time in these places and sometimes I push it to sleep in them because they're not normally accommodations and you need a lot of classic people that dog there that dog um collects money <laughs> from the patrons so when you finish the muckily you, know, you get the dog the money <laughs> and, he puts, and then he puts up to her and he won't release the money until she gets a person or something. <laughs> and then she grabs the money and then she put the change in there because you don't have any tub one denominations, there's no all that ones. And he'll walk back and give you the money. But he'll want something from you for that too. <laughs> so you gotta get because they're just nearly as a little grumpy sometimes, eh? And my last photo, Banya Bong Tidi Sun, very famous mountain Banya Bong, there's a ton of folk stories about Banya Bong and Tidi Sun. Tidi Sun itself should be a sacred mountain. Another, you know, another thing about Korea or South Korea is they don't have tried to nominate some of their mountains as being sacred because in the US they recognize sacred mountains, not as well heritage sites, but something different. So if they started making mountains sacred, you know, they could probably build up in something towards making the back today gun in the UNESCO or the heritage site as well. So if you start connecting with these little pockets, special places together, and connecting them back to the back today gun, and then getting the North Koreans on board, who knows what they could do towards at least the Korean people are sharing something similar, which currently they're not. Okay? So, it could be something worth this one. And that's it. Thank you very much. Roger may be able to answer some of the questions you have. 
two days out, we visited Tom and John to have a look, make sure everything was ready. And this is working with the United Nations Military Command, this is working with the Ministry of Unification, this is working with the New Zealand Embassy, this is working with 13 different government departments within North Korea just to accommodate the bot to us. Yeah? It was like, the amount of work they did was insane uh, to make it happen. And um, no one can contact us in, contact us in DPRK. So the New Zealand Defence Attaché member, uh, two days out, we weren't there at the time, okay, he got on a loudspeaker and started yelling out to the North Koreans, you can't let the New Zealanders through Pum on time. Huh? It's a violation of the United Nations, blah, blah, blah. Huh? Can you imagine the reaction of the North Korean soldiers standing there listening to this guy, you know, harp on that, telling them what to do? And it's like the most sensitive part of the world. Anyway, we got this message back, and um, the New Zealand guy said, you got to let them go to the gas on. <laughs> Please don't let them to gas on. So he's very polite about it. This New Zealand is trying to right? And, uh, but he had to shut. And, um, and then, so in two days, the North Koreans actually managed to change the logistics from Pumlin John to gas on. So they had to actually, you know, like, you know, I don't know, so they swallowed their pride and, and say, okay, we'll do what you need. Because it doesn't really happen like that, eh? Hey, this interference stuff. You know? As soon as someone disagrees, it's like, yeah, okay, no more talking. See you next time. So we've got through gas on. So the South Koreans believed that we would never get there. They thought that we, I found all this out later on, that we wouldn't actually get that far. We wouldn't firstly get into the country, secondly, we'd be never given permission to leave it through that area. So I, from what I heard from very good reliable sources was, even though they said, yeah, okay, we'll let you through, when it actually happened, they didn't know what to do. Because right? there's a lot of red tape and bureaucracy here. This is what happens with developed nations. New Zealand, America, Australia, UK. You know, when there's a process, there's a lot of people getting to talk to, to make it happen. In DPRK, there's only one guy who says what you can do and can't do, right? If he says it's okay, you want to go to it. Right? So, it's kind of interesting. Um, and they wrote that they, they caused and they went through all the way to Halasan. And um, at Halasan they took some rocks they kept from Pakistan and they threw them into the Great Lake Halasan. It's a message of North Korea. Second question. Yes, there is a lot of deforestation in North Korea. Um, and they are correct. Um, but it's basically around the areas where there's population. Pyongyang, Gyeongsang, Gwangsan. Um, Obviously, there's a lot of crops being grown in North Korea, okay, but it's all flat, there have been rice fields for ages, but a lot of the mountains are to you. But the big mountains where the people don't live are very, very pristine, very untouched, very stunning parts of, you know, one of the probably last untouched pieces of natural wilderness left in the world. And as I explained before, that's due to lack of population, lack of infrastructure, and lack of demand. Because, you know, they can't trade internationally. So there's no demand for their natural resources anyway, other than what China's giving out. So you can sure, which is coal and hard for timbers. So it will change, but who knows.